it looks like to me is that something came here and tampered with DNA and all the chimeras and all the weird shit you see on pyramid walls. It's like half man, half bull and all this weird shit. I um, even when you look at the ancient Sumerian texts, it talks a lot about those who from heaven to earth came and, you know, they created a slave species. Like and the, so there's the Nephilim. A, the Nephilim was part, yes, the giants of the Bible, all that kind of stuff, you know, because the, 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 the fallen angels took women for wives and had give birth to giants. I mean, there's a whole series of stories and color that we can paint with that someone fucked with our DNA. I believe that the DNA molecule shoots information into the source. And and our experiences and our feelings, the DNA molecule is very rare for that job. And that's why the DNA or there's something about the genome that is that is desired by other life forms that don't have that power right. and that connection. What is the most beautiful or fascinating aspect of human biology at the level of the cell to you? The micro machines and the nano machines that proteins make and become, that to me is the most interesting. The fact that you have this basically dynamic computer within every cell that's constantly processing its environment. And at the heart of it is DNA, which is a dynamic machine, a dynamic computation process. People think of the DNA as a linear code. It's codes within codes within codes. And it is the actually the epigenetic state that's doing this amazing processing. I mean, if you ever wanted to believe in God, just look inside the cell. Um, but, you know, you'd spend a lot of time in man discussing consciousness and DNA consciousness and DNA in particular. And, you know, and you delve into the work of Crick uh, and, you know, the beginnings of uh, <laughs> DNA and the discovery of the chromosomes and things along those lines um, and, uh, and the human genetic code. And you also mentioned uh, the concept of of something called directed panspermia. Uh, can you explain what you mean by that or what Crick might have meant by that? Yeah, it was Crick that came up. I mean, he didn't necessarily come up with it, but he, he wrote a paper on it. He, he mm -hmm. defended this idea. Um, Crick, of course, was one of the three you know discoverers of the double helix, the, d the structure of the DNA uh, code, as we know. But that was like in 1960, right? So right. that wasn't that long ago. And um, the reason that I'm fascinated by DNA, Crick's discovery in particular, but also all this research that's been done since then on DNA, is that it, it's 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 astonishing. It's it doesn't make sense really, in a way. Four chemicals, four chemicals, four letters of the alphabet create everything that lives on this planet. Every living thing is composed of DNA, and the DNA only has four freaking letters in that particular. So the, 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 the dictionary, the encyclopedia is vast with only four letters. I use 26 letters when I write my overly long books, and I can't imagine, you know, doing it with only four letters, you know, which yeah. my readers would appreciate if I tried. But you have four letters and the combinations of them, the mathematical combinations of them create everything that, that exists. And yet... Even with those four letters, there are only 64 possible combinations of those four letters in groups of three. Now, you have to read the book to understand this and look at the charts and stuff. But there's only 64 possible um, nucleotides. So you have you know, a, a G and a T together, for instance, and then there's a sugar and a phosphate, and that's a nucleotide. And then you, you put three of them together, and that forms one of the codons of the genetic code. There are 64 possible combinations, 64 codons. 64 seem like a weird number, right? We're all yeah. sort of base 10, you know, because we have 10 fingers and 10 toes and we think in terms of 10. Um, but not every culture did, not every culture does. And 64 seemed like an odd number to, to, to be the basis of all existence, living existence, organic life. And then I realized, of course, that the, the I Ching, the famous Chinese book of changes, uh, is created and developed exactly the same way. There are 64 possible combinations of solid and broken lines in groups of three. So you have 64, uh, 64 tri, uh, hexagrams. So, and that 
series of 64 hexagrams basically discusses all the process that exists in the universe, right? According to the Chinese philosophy, whatever exists can be found on this chart. There, it's an, it's a, the process of changing from one state to another, which is a very important concept. And Leibniz, the, the famous uh, mathematician of a couple of hundred years ago, then he devoted a lot of study to the I Ching, to those 64 hexagrams, because he felt this was the beginning of the binary code, right? That we use today in computers. But it goes back further than that. I, I write about it in, in more depth in, in Secret Machines uh, because it, it's not only the 64 that fascinates me, but it's the double helix of the DNA. Helixes, helices exist in nature, right? We find them in a lot of different places. We'd never find a double helix, you know, one helix wrapped around another, that famous, right. that famous symbol. That does not exist in nature except in the DNA molecule. And yet, in esoteric traditions, again, starting in China hundreds of years ago, they depict the father and the mother of creation as two beings with tails that wrap around each other as, a, as a, in a double helix. And since we didn't know about that until 1960, these people writing hundreds of years ago sort, sort of identified that. And they were also the people who talked about 64 hexagrams. So you have the combination of the 64 hexagrams, the double helix creation and the process of creation in a nice, nice, neat package in China, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. I mean, the I Ching goes back more than a thousand years. So we're talking about a kind of unconscious realization. I mean, if we're, if we have the genetic code in every cell of our body, it kind of would stand to reason that we kind of unconsciously think in those terms that we have that, that image is there somewhere, right? Possibly. Of course, I'm being very speculative and very fanciful on this, but if every cell in our body has a double helix in it, and it's a manifestation of those 64 uh, possible combinations, I mean, that's who we are. And the Chinese understood it somehow. And in other cultures in Africa, they understood it. They developed similar similar uh, ideas, similar pictures, serpents and the, the hexagrams and the, the whole thing, the idea of changes through a binary code system of process. All of this is, is everywhere in the world. We've ignored it because it was superstition. It was divination. It was to tell the future. It was stuff that is not scientific. And then we go well, one step further. I just, one more thing is these two sure. mathematicians in Kazakhstan freaked me out when they published a paper a couple of years ago. Um, and they said that there's something really weird about how the chromosomes are arranged because there are stop codes and start codes separating one group from another. If they didn't, we'd be horribly misshapen, right? We wouldn't be the way we are. We wouldn't have separate things for arms, legs, eyes, and all the rest of it. So they asked the question, how does it happen that between one code and another code, there's a specific code that says stop, now start again, like a period at the end of a sentence. So in genetics, there is no run-on sentence. There are periods that break up these sequences. And they said, mathematically, that shouldn't be possible. I mean, zero was not even discovered until a few hundred years ago. Yeah. The Roman numerals didn't have zero. They used all the L's and M's and X's and I's. There was no way to compute using zero. The Aztecs had zero and in ancient India, they had zero. Eventually they, they brought that to the West and that became part of math, but there, there's no zero in nature. Like there's no double helix in nature. To the, the two scientists, something had to have invented or programmed the, the genetic code to start and stop appropriately. It, they, they looked at it and they said, this is math. This is not, you know, this is not biology. This is not some normal process. What normal process has a zero built in or, or a period? So take all of that, right? And Crick came up with this idea of directed panspermia. First, panspermia itself as the name implies, means that somehow the DNA code was seeded all over the universe and only took in certain places. Directed panspermia, which is what Crick wrote about, says that someone or something deliberately seeded the planet with the genetic code, with RNA possibly before DNA, but deliberately did the seeding. It was directed, it was intentional because there are certain chemicals that you need to create DNA for it to flourish. And they're in very short supply in the universe. They only exist in certain places. And in order to, for the DNA to flourish, 
they had to pick a planet where there was some of that chemical present or else the whole thing would have fallen flat on its face. And that was Francis Crick's uh, idea of directed panspermia. To answer your question after like an hour. But yeah. no, no. There's another peer reviewed paper called The Wow Signal in the Genetic Code by a couple of mathematicians from, I think, Uzbekistan. Hmm. Uh, and I don't pretend to understand the math, and I'm sure there's some statisticians that would argue with it, but their concept was interesting. Hmm. The, um, the, the actual, what we call the genetic code, the, the uh, transfer RNAs that basically say, you know, a proline goes here, a leucine goes there, that allow for the um, proteins to be made. Mm -hmm. um, they are so well organized mm -hmm. in terms of the structure of the of who codes for what um, that it looks like it was designed, right? And then they go through some mathematical models of why it had to have been designed, and you know, there's some caveats that I'll mention at the end here, uh, that uh, the chance of it not having been designed is like one in several hundred trillion. Right. Right. And th what they're saying is the wow message. So you've heard of this thing called the wow message that when somebody first thought that they heard a radio signal from another civilization, they said, wow, they wrote wow on it. And that became the wow signal. <laughs> so they said, look, the signal is actually in our DNA. The fact that the that DNA was planned and organized is right there in front of us. That's the wow signal. Huh. Let me ask you this as a scientist, Kurt. If I said to you, um, Kurt, you have a task. Um, you can make it out of whatever you want, any material you want. Your goal is to, in a million years, you have to create something now that will last a million years to prove you were here. What would you do? How would you do it? Think about it. Go ahead. No, 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 no. Let's do, let's, let's, I, I love you, man, but we're going to, we're going to have this mental exercise right now. I think it's important. And by the way, it's not a trick question and I'm, I'm not playing gotcha. Just, but would you give me just some examples that you might throw out there to say, okay, I'm, I would make something out of this or out of that. Or... There are some meta materials that seem to be harder than diamond. So whatever's our hardest material, it would be made out of that. Also, just so you know, I don't classify myself as a scientist. I I'm more of a hobbyist, let's say. So that's what I would do. Fair so you'd find some sort of hard material that would outlast just about anything else on earth, right? Where would you put right. that material? Where, right. where would you right. put it? Orbit is one place. Okay. And hopefully a non-retrograde orbit, right? So geosynchronous and hopefully nothing would perturb it in a million years. Chances are something would, but okay. Hypothetically in orbit. Good. Um, you know, here on earth, it's really hard to make anything that lasts more than a few thousand years. You can even make the pyramids and look at them now and say, wow, those things are 5,000 years old and you know they don't look so great. And probably in another 5,000 years, they're not going to look good at all. And, and they might last eventually till a hill of, you might have a, a little a hill of sand in a hundred thousand years, but that's going to be about it. And that's made out of rock, right? Mount Mushmore, same thing. It's going to be gone in, in 10,000 years. You won't probably even recognize it. it'll be too worn. Um, even mountains in millions of years become deserts, right? Uh, time moves on. Uh, then you have the subduction zones of Earth that eventually, if you wait long enough on the, on the surface of the planet, it all gets recycled anyways. It's all going to get you know sucked down into the mantle and, and get spit out the other end and, and as new land. So, so nothing is indelible on this planet. It's, it's constantly changing. And, and to create something that can last the, the sands of time, so to speak, is a lot harder than one might think. You know, the few examples we have here on Earth uh, that are man-made. You can look to the pyramids. You can look at things um, like uh, Stonehenge, but that's a blink of an eye. The, that those aren't the, the, that those were just made a few thousand years ago, and they're not going to be around, um, you know, for for a whole long lot of time. That's just not the way Earth is. So, if we're trying to find some sort of of some sort of marker chances are you're not going to find it buried in the earth unless it only happened maybe the last 5,000 years ago or so, right? Even some of the most, most dramatic examples of terraforming, let's look at, for example, uh, the meteor impact crater in, in Arizona it happened 60,000 years ago. Um, that's already filling in, 
you know, in, in another hundred thousand years from now, you may not even know anything ever happened because of the processes of earth and what this planet does. Um, it's constantly erasing what's on the surface and is constantly burying what lies beneath deeper and deeper and deeper until eventually, it, you know, it gets recycled. So, um, you know, that's, it, it, it's, that's a hard question. You know, what would last long enough for us to go back and say, wow, this is an indicator of alien life on this planet 100,000 years ago. What would you have to do to, to achieve that, to accomplish that? Um, it's a lot harder than one might think. And then again, would you recognize it? Uh, one might say, well, DNA, DNA is a perfect example. If you wanted to, to do something that was enduring for humanity, that we could look back a hundred thousand years ago and say, yes, that was absolutely manipulated by an intelligent life form. Well, deoxyribonucleic acid, uh, may be one way to do it. You can put coding and sequencing in there that will perpetuate over time and time. And yes, you'll have some de degradation over generations, but, but in essence, you could do something that way. And it basically it's a biological marker, right? So we have to be careful when we say we look for, for evidence because evidence isn't just necessarily a spearhead found in the Bighorn Mountains from 11,000 years ago. It's not necessarily a pyramid sitting in the middle of a desert. It could be far more sophisticated than that. You said put it in orbit, right? Well, what if, if we put that rather than in orbit, we put it into the human body, you know? So anyways, that's, 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 I know it's a very long winded way to answer that question. Yeah. Let me ask a quick follow up and then we'll get to super chat questions, audience questions and so on. Are there places that we should be looking for evidence that you feel like we're not? So, for example, I mentioned archaeological investigation sites. The reason I brought that up is some people say craft were found. Okay, but you're also saying there may be other markers, maybe, possibly, biologically, for example. And, you know, um, near-Earth celestial bodies like the moon, where you don't have atmospheric friction, you don't have the, the, you don't have the tectonic processes that we have here on Earth that are constantly recycling, you know? You know, someone might want to put something on the moon. Um, if you want to, you know, reminiscent of, um, what was it? Uh, 2001 space, 2000 space, 2001 space odyssey, right? Where you have these, these monolithic markers. Um, that's certainly one way to do it. You know, you could put something, uh, where you don't have those, those same, um, those same processes occurring where maybe you, you could, you might be able to extend your time twice as long for leaving some sort of archeological evidence, um, the evidence could be right here, could be right in front of us, could be within genetic sequencing. Uh, it could even be more obvious than that. It could be the very fact that we're alive and we're on this planet is, is an example of, of some intelligent life somewhere making a decision that life needs to exist on this planet. Um, we need to be open to all of that. We, we really do. I, I think um, we need to cast a very wide net. And this is why we say all options have to be on the table until they're not on the table, because you may be surprised. Um, something that's super, super intelligent probably isn't going to build a pyramid uh, that's only going to last, you know, 20,000 years. They're going to do something that's far more enduring, something that will really be, you know, no kidding.